what we do here is go back, 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 back. You are now listening to the Sports of the Podcast with Shaheem Sutherland. Hey everyone, I'm Shaheem Sutherland, your host, and if you're a first-time listener, welcome to the Sports Lit Podcast. If you're a regular listener, welcome back. Also, Happy New Year's. So far, it's two days into 2K19, and everything is going well. I hope it's the same for you guys, too. But without further ado, today's guest is professional football player Vincent Brown. Brown is a native of Miami. He played college football for Southern Mississippi and Pittsburgh State. After college, Brown played in the CFL and participated in the 2018 inaugural season of the new football league, Year Call Football. How's that for introduction, Vincent? That sounds great. That sounds great. (laughs) Did I miss anything? No, sir, you didn't. You didn't. That sounds great. Oh, cool. So how was, um, well, before I even ask you about the CFL, Happy New Year's. Thank you. Same to you. Happy New Year to you and your family. Thank you. Uh, do you have any New Year's resolutions? Uh, yes, sir, I do. My only New Year's resolution is to take more chances. Take more chances? I like that. Yes, sir. Take more chances, whether it's with a job, with something that I may second guess. I just want to just say, um, forget it and just go for it and just take a chance. Because how I see it, for the new year coming coming um uh, coming up, I just feel like the worst that could happen is I could just I could just stay in the same place, or I could either learn from it, or come out or come out successful. I agree. I'm taking a chance, so I definitely want to make that my only my only New Year's resolution, moving forward. I like that. I like that. That kind of stops you from having any regrets in the future. Definitely. Definitely. Well, my New Year's resolution is not as deep as yours was, but mine is taking it one day at a time. That's definitely a good New Year's resolution. That's definitely a good resolution. Definitely a good one. Yeah, because, you know, you can think about things months in advance and you can cause stress, unnecessary stress. And, you know, it's the second day of, you know, the new year and you're not even at the period where you know what you're stressing about is about to occur so just take it one day at a time definitely i can agree 100 percent. so in the introduction i mentioned that you played in the cfl uh can you tell me the teams that you played for well my journey in the cfl was a was a wild one i uh (laughs) it's funny because i actually didn't want to play in the cfl at first um whenever i was Whenever I was come uh, coming out in 2015 to be a part of the NFL draft, I was coming out of Pittsburgh State in Pittsburgh, Kansas, and the Montreal Alouettes at the time. The the GM's name was Joey Abrams and Jim Pop. Both of them were general manager and assistant general manager, and they had claimed my rights. So they they essentially wanted me to come and try Canada out, but I was just really skeptical of it the CFL because I was confident in myself to, that I was an NFL caliber player. <laughs> so I wasn't necessarily open to that. However, um, after I after the process was over and I went to a mini camp with the Jaguars and I didn't make it through, I still wanted to play football. Um, I still had a competitive desire. So I, I eventually ended up there and I played in Canada. My initial thought when I got the plane was, wow, this is a lot like New York. <laughs> Montreal is a beautiful city, um, very cultured, uh, predominantly French um, in the city of Quebec. It's a very nice city, and um, the fans have a really big passion for football. I know um, if you still follow them recently, you can tell that they have like Mike Sherman, who's the head coach now, and they, they recently uh, acquired Johnny Manziel, so... It's a good football city, and the fans care about their football. And also, the organi- the organization was a good organization when I played for them. Um, I had some good coaching, and I also met some really good teammates and people on and off the field. Man, I, I got a whole bunch of questions for you now. I already had questions, but 
with everything that you just told me is just more fuel. So, um, when you said that they claimed your rights, can you go um into depth about that? Because you know some people who are listening, they might not, you know, understand what that means. They might think, oh, right when you declared, they said, oh, you're on our team. Can you go kind of into detail of what that means? Okay, sure. Um, the how I understand it, whenever they claim your rights, is if you're an American player, um. In the CFL, if you're scouted, then and, and and a team wants you, or a team feels like they have a chance to land you in the Canadian Football League, then they can claim your rights. Which means that if you were to ever um, want to play in Canada for any of the nine teams, that they would have they would have the first right the first option to negotiate with you on a contract. You would have to negotiate with a specific team. In my situation, it was the Montreal Alouettes. So basically I didn't have a I didn't have an option to choose any of the nine teams or any of the nine teams couldn't choose to could 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 not speak with me due to the fact of Montreal having my rights and me being on their negotiation list. So therefore, with that being said, playing in Canada, I had to play for the Montreal Alouettes essentially in the beginning because they put me on their negotiation list so they have a negotiated contract with me. Okay, so that means you were probably on the radar for a while, even when you were at Pittsburgh State. Yes. Yes, I was. Okay. And um, you, you said Montreal's a lot like New York? Yes, I think so. The city is, is very... A lot of buildings. Um, Not much land. <laughs> I could say <laughs> that. It's, it's, it's very city-like. And it's Americanized as well. Okay. It's Americanized, so I mean, it has like a subway system, and people speak English, French, so it's uh, it's Americanized. So you weren't as homesick then, when you were there. Oh no, I wasn't. I actually wasn't homesick whenever I left for college at all because I played at Southern Mississippi, and then I played at um, I played at um Pittsburgh State. So being being home wasn't really a factor for me. Oh. Hey, you know the the name Pittsburgh State is kind of ironic because. When I first heard about it, um, I heard about it before I, I read about you. I actually knew someone named John Brown. I knew of him. And when I heard Pittsburgh State, I'm like, okay, so it's in like Pennsylvania because it's Pittsburgh State. So right. I'm having a conversation with someone and it's a no, bro, it's not in Pitts it's not in Pennsylvania. And so, you know, I went on Google and I found out it was in Kansas. Correct. Yeah. Correct, correct, correct. Actually John Brown's actually a Miami guy as well. Yeah. John Brown's a Miami guy, and John John Brown's an awesome dude, man. Very humble, works hard. Um, as soon as I got to Pittsburgh State, all, all I heard was stories about how he, how he probably dropped two passes his whole career. <laughs> so I mean, he's an awesome guy, works hard, quiet to himself, awesome guy. Yeah, he had a, a huge career there. I, it's I'm, I'm gonna say it again, it's just a small world because the same high school he went to, I I went there too, so. I know about him and his whole, you know, his story and his brother and all of that. It's, okay, okay, okay. That's good for him. Like everything that's happened for him is, is a blessing. Definitely, without a doubt. Yeah, but you guys, Pittsburgh State was a legit team from what I from what I saw when you guys were on TV. Definitely, that's that's a that's that's probably one of the best Division twos you can you could possibly enroll in and play sports. Um, awesome fan base. It's a small town, so it kind of gives you the Friday night lights feel. Whenever whenever it's game day, nothing else matters, which was awesome. And obviously, they obviously put guys in the NFL. Not not only John Brown, but I have a good friend of mine named Devonte Bosby who plays for the Eagles right now. Okay, and he went. To, he was he was my teammate. And he played he, he played at Pittsburgh State as well. He's another awesome guy. But he's from the Kansas City, Missouri area. Awesome guy. And uh, also, uh, Pittsburgh State has awesome has awesome coaches. Uh, Tim Beck, awesome coach, a uh, family man, and also I believe Pittsburgh State now they have one of the one one of the best indoors facilities in all of college football. So I I take it whenever you're in that area you go and take advantage of it. <laughs> well, I haven't been back, but um, whenever I was whenever I was working out for pro day. Um, for probably I definitely worked out in the in the, in the facilities. Definitely, yes, I did. Okay, 
So so let's let's go back to talking about, you know, CFL in Canada. So you said you were in Montreal and you said Montreal is in Quebec? It's in Quebec City. Quebec City. So how far away is that from Toronto? I believe Toronto's like six hours away. Yeah. Have you been I there? So. Yes, I have. I've I played there. I played there. Oh yeah, obviously. Well, yeah, man. yeah. I <laughs> yeah, I have. I, I played there. I played there. So between Toronto and Montreal, which one is reminds you more of New York? I would say it's. I would say it's neck and neck, man. Honestly, neck um, neck. Tor Toronto doesn't have the French feel. Okay. But Toronto is very Americanized. You know, I, I tell people all the time: if you ever have any second, second, second doubts about. I mean, second thoughts about Canada. You just just think about it like this: Toronto still has um, big sports franchises, like they have the Raptors, mm -hmm. and they have the Blue Jays, the Toronto Blue Jays as well. So, it's Americanized. It's not like a. I mean, Canada's still North America, so it's still it's still Americanized pretty much. People speak English and stuff like that, so it's it's cool. So you know, football is football. But I do know in in Canada, there are a couple of differences when it comes to playing football. How was it adjusting to the way that league plays football? Well, I'll tell you what, from an offensive from an offensive standpoint, you will get tired fast. Okay. <laughs> just, be, just because um, in America and in, in the NFL and this American football period, we have three downs to pick up the first down and the fourth down and you're punting down. However, in Canada, you have two downs to pick up the first down and third down is your punting down. So if the offense gets off the field quick and the defense gets off the field quick, then you're right back. Man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh. so you're right back. So um, you definitely have to be in shape. Yeah, you definitely, definitely have to good cardio. Definitely, you definitely do because things it, it's it, it's it's like it's like this, man. You get on the field, you get a two and out. You're like, okay, you sit on the sideline, and before you know it, it's, uh, first down. If they don't get if they don't get a good amount of yardage, just punt team alert. And you're like, damn, I, I just sat down, and you got to strap up and go back out there. So, um, that's pretty much what it is. But I mean, um, all in all, it's still football. Still, you know, you, you you still have to be technical and physical and things like that of that nature. But you you just have to pick up your your yardage sooner. So adjusting to it, it wasn't that difficult for you. Not necessarily. Um, as far as my position that I played, I'm an offensive tackle, an offensive lineman. So therefore, I had to adjust to um, the defense being a yard off the ball. They were a yard off the ball um, prior to the initial snap. Okay. I, kn I know the corners probably have to be really fast because if you got receivers coming at you, basically, what? They're, they already get to run before the, the snap, right? That's one. That's one receiver. And he's usually called the bomber. The bomber? Okay. So I'm assuming that the defensive back who's guarding him has to probably be like the fastest on covering him yeah or he has to play deep <laughs> he has to yeah. play off a little bit so yeah he can a lot of a zone good, a good start. yeah oh man that's a lot of running Whew. it is it definitely is yeah yeah <laughs> okay so when you were in the cfl online it said you were there from what 2015 to 2017 yes i was there 2015 2017 i was there off and on i probably got released I got released about two, two times, two three times, but I got called back every time. Okay, but just due to due to roster moves, like injuries here, injuries there, so they had to make roster moves and and you know release a, release a younger guy, which is that's that's the thing about uh, about Canadian football as well. Um, if you're not Canadian and you're American, then you're probably most likely going to be released first. Oh man, even if right. you're better. It, I would say even if even even if you are better, you you probably will be released first because there, there's a there's a ratio. I believe that I believe that uh, you're only allowed to have uh, um like 15 Americans. That's it. 
Okay. About 15, I believe maybe 12, 12 to 15. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they expanded it or, or whatever, but um, majority of the time, they try to use those on their skill players. So they try to get American receivers and American defensive backs. And uh, and uh, on every other position, they try to just fill it with nationals, Canadian nationals, just because. All right, so I'm going to make a, a educated assumption or guess on this. So you just said that they normally try to get American receivers and American corners or like safeties or whatnot. Would you say that American football players – are more talented or have a have a, a notch ahead of like say players who are from Canada? I would definitely say that. I would definitely say that. I've seen I've seen some good guys. I, I when I was in Montreal, I played with some really talented guys that are not on teams right now in the CFL. Like I, for example, I played with um, Todd Boyd, the quarterback from Clemson. Uh huh. He was with me in Montreal. He's not on the team right now. I believe he retired from football. I believe he did. Yeah, I think he's I'm like a broadcaster sure. now. Yeah. I spoke I, I speak with Todd's Boyd. Um and a few other guys. Okay. I see. So you you mentioned that, you know, the CFL it was kind of on and off. I know after the CFL you participated in a uh, your call football. Can you Yeah, your your call football. Your call football was an awesome experience. Awesome experience. Um, my two head coaches were Merrill Hodge and Mike Sherman. Merrill Hodge is a class act guy, class act guy, and so is Mike. And so is Mike Sherman. Uh, Coach Mike Sherman, man, he he's definitely the epitome of what it's like to play for to play professional football. He uh, he wants what he wants, <laughs> and he will coach you until he gets it. You know, but all in all, he's he's a man of not too many words. He's very detail oriented, and he and he holds everybody accountable. He's an awesome guy. Um, Merrill Hodge was more of a players' coach. He, um, he's younger. Of course, Merrill Hodge is the ESPN analyst. Mm-hmm. Um, class that guy as well. He's more of a players' coach. He he really, he wanted the players to have more fun. Um. But all in all, both of them really taught me a lot about being a professional and, and, and doing the little things right. Awesome experience. Your call football is going to be great. As a matter of fact, um, your, call, your call football season two is coming up. Oh, when it, when does it begin? It begins in February. In February? It begins in, it's, it begins in February, and it's going to be at the Jacksonville Jaguars facilities. Oh, wow. So it's not going to be in Vero anymore? No, it will not be in Vero Beach. It's going to be at the Jacksonville Jaguar facilities. And your call football season two is going to be, I expect it to be just as good, if not better, than the first one. That's good. I know you're looking forward to it. Yes, I am looking forward to it. Everyone that, that has something to do with uh, your call football has been nothing but nothing but um, kind to me. And and not only me, but every player that's participated. Top notch organization in your call football. And I want to uh, give a special thanks to Colin Bataha and Julie Maringer, class act people. Yeah. Also, Eric, also Eric Galco for for scouting and and doing the proper uh, assessments to get to get the right players to make that thing to make your call work. Yeah, I've I've gotten in contact with Julie. She she seems like a, a very nice person. I like the fact that she's, you know, the position that she holds. And she's a woman. I think that's a great thing, especially for like women and showing that, you know, they can, you know, play a role in such a sport and be effective. I think that's a, a great uh, stepping stone that other women can look at and try to follow her path. Definitely, definitely. And to and to understand the position that she holds being being uh being one of the important people in the, in the in the front office for your call football, and for us to be taken care of the way we we're taken care of was, was awesome. We had awesome food, awesome coaches, facilities were clean, um, from top to bottom, man, awesome. Okay, so now that you know, we, I found out you know what is going to be happening for you in you know your football career you know your call football which is february after your call football the goal is to 
you know, sign with another a team, correct? Definitely. Definitely. Your call football your call football is um one of the primary focuses were were development. And it's becoming better players. A lot of the players on the Your Call Football roster were guys that had professional experience, whether it's the uh arena, CFL or NFL. But guys that were just missing that one thing to get them back to where they were. You understand? So um these these weren't these aren't just guys off the street. You know, these are guys that have been professionals before and are in the same and are in the same circuit of players who can still play. There's lots of good competition there. So are you guys gonna be playing in the, the Jaguar Stadium for the for the games or where will you guys play? Well, that hasn't been announced yet. <laughs> that hasn't been announced yet. However, it will be big. Okay. It will be big. That'd be, that'd be <laughs> nice. That would be nice. Yeah, it would. It would. All right, so what do you do to try to get teams' attention? Like say when it does when it's time for you to leave your call football and then join like a CFL or NFL team. What what are the points or what are the the things you try to do to, you know, get on to a team's radar? Well, you definitely have to you definitely have to handle yourself with the, with the proper balance on and off the field. Um, you have to make sure that you're a team guy, all about team and not necessarily about self. Um, you have to make sure you're coachable. Um, that's big. That's big because a lot of the times what I notice on the professional level, what I notice is the coaches don't really have the patience to, to sit there and teach you just because for it being a professional organization, whatever it is, um, you could be released in a heartbeat and they'll just call the next guy in who can do it. So you have to make sure that you that you can control what you can control to the best of your ability. And also, um, an important thing about about being a pro, you have you have different different things that play a factor into it, like taking care of your body, making sure you're healthy, making sure you're getting the proper rest, uh, making sure you're studying. Um, it doesn't matter if your playbook's ten pages or or or, or hundred pages. You got to make sure you're studying because coaches like that. And and also just controlling what you control and just and just making sure you're you're producing on the field. That's it. Just go out there and have fun. I remember it's a game. Yeah, iron the sky doesn't lie, right? That's right. That's very true. <laughs> okay, so earlier you mentioned that you know when you were in the CFL, you were on and off. So during the time when, like, say you're off, you're considered a free agent. Correct. How do you live off of your income as a free agent? Before you answer it, um, I have a, a list of things that I want to ask you because I would like to get the insight from a person who's lived being a free agent and how they're able to budget and, you know, structure the way they live. So then they're not stressing or struggling until they, you know, get onto another a team. Being completely honest, it's tough. Um, it's very, very tough. Actually, as soon as I as soon as I came home here to Miami, as soon as I came home, I actually started working. Uh ASAP. Um I actually even to this day now I still I, I teach. I'm a substitute teacher in elementary school. But um it's difficult to say the least just because Every move is every move once you release is off faith. You understand what I'm saying? Like once you release, you don't know who will call you for whatever reason to do what. Um, whenever you get called back, you may not be on the active roster. You may be on the practice squad, and that'll be it. And that and that'll be a difference in your salary as well. But 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 it's very difficult. Um, all I can say is just um rely on your support you know your family to help you get through to help you get through those tough times that's definitely going to be important just because you know that 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 feeling of being released and let go isn't a good one <laughs> it's very it's very drug out you know um 
oftentimes your body's beat up from practice or whatever, just leaving it all out there. And uh, the plane ride home's often long. <laughs> you know, so it's just, I would just say, just being honest, it is difficult. Uh, Shaheen, but you, you you just have to rely on your family and, and, and the people around you, your loved ones to help you get through. Thank you for your honesty. I, I really appreciate that. I think what you just said will help other individuals who listen to this because, you know, players, they think, oh, I'm going to play. And then they don't really think about what can happen afterwards. And I think it's important that, you know, they they prepare for the best, but then they also, you know, prepare for the worst and know what is needed to be done in order for you to get by until, you know, you reach that next um, step or or like ladder that will help you get to where you want to be. And the job position that you, you hold right now, that is a very good uh, job position. I, I myself, I do that. I, I substitute on the side. Um, right now, I'm, I'm actually doing like a interventionist position, but I'll talk about that with you after the interview. But I think a lot of players should look into, you know, job opportunities like that just to hold you over until, you know, you get signed with another team. Definitely. So you you, you mentioned you have a job in addition to, you know, playing football. So how do you budget? Um, honestly, Shaheem, I'm very cheap. <laughs> I'm very cheap. Um, I don't spend money on what's not necessary. If it's not food or or gas or you know a, a phone bill, then I'm not I'm not necessarily spending money on it. Um, the main goal is to is to uh, make a profit. Exactly. And in, 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 in the end, you know, not spend. And that and not being in love with the materialistic things. I mean, like materialistic things are so are so non unimportant. Um, but also just what, what helps also is keeping myself busy. Um, just um, staying active, and just and just um, doing things with my time that can prevent me from spending money. Whether it's working out or or uh, doing something else that can keep my mind off of spending money or going into my savings. I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, being, you know, frugal, you know, frugal helps you to, you know, not go broke. You know, sometimes a lot of players, they'll get that signing bonus or their cash flow will increase. And then as soon as it, it increases, you know, they go straight to the mall. And drop some money, get the latest J's or whatever they see other teammates getting. You know how that goes. Definitely. Definitely. So if you could, what are some financial tips you would give to athletes who are preparing for free agency or who are already free agents? Um, that's difficult just because that feeling whenever that feeling of knowing that um uh, the bills won't stop coming um the biggest the biggest thing that i would that i would tell anybody prefer, preparing for that transition is uh if you haven't already started saying no say no a lot of times whenever you're in that position of being an athlete you feel obligated to help everybody who may have, who may have helped you or may have been a good person to you along the way. But in that same, in that same respect or that same regard, you can't really help people like that once you're uh, unemployed or just working out for on, on faith or just believing that something will happen with, with nothing guaranteed. Um, and, and like I said, uh, uh, learn how to say no. And the second thing I would say is keep yourself busy. But keep yourself busy in a way where you could make something, such as um, I wake up in the morning, I work out, and then I go to work, which is which is uh, at this at, at a elementary school. But that's the majority of my day. That's that's from eight twenty in the morning until three o'clock in the in the, in the evening. You know, 
there's still plenty of time left in the day for me to do something else, but the majority of my day is gone. And especially after work out in the morning and then dealing with kids and and the whole day, I'm not really motivated to go to the mall and and, and spend money after that. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. Kids, the dream. Yeah, they do. They do. So, so pretty much, you know, I just, I just keep myself busy in that regard. And then after that, you know, I I won't really want to, get into any activities like that or whatever because I'm tired from going to work. I agree. And, you know, it's funny um, how you mentioned they know because I had a, I was going to ask you that a little bit further down in this interview, but you know what? I'm going to knock those questions out right now. And um, I just want to see how you feel about them. Um, as a free agent, do you think people respect your situation? I would say no, because I don't, I don't, I don't feel like everybody understands what it takes to even get to the point that, that, that I've gotten to. And as far as being a professional and being able to get opportunities to play, um, because even though, even though I've never been NFL status with a, with a big contract, um, it still says a lot for somebody to want to go on, go on, go in their pocket and financially provide for you for doing something, for playing a sport. Um, I don't care if you go to McDonald's. Even if you pay a dollar for a McChicken, I mean, I'm still giving you a dollar for you to give me something. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of feel like, especially me personally, like in my personal um, transition, I kind of feel like m- maybe some people close to me were kind of just like, well, what are you going to do now? In a sense of, you know, them not actually understanding the feeling of going through that. You know, they were just like, well, what are you going to do now? <laughs> and, and and that's not really the best feeling just because, you know, you don't know how to answer them. Because a lot of times, and um, athletes, we're so conditioned. We're so conditioned to get up, go to practice, go to class, um, work out, watch film. We're so conditioned to one way of living or one way of doing things to the point where a lot of times whenever, whenever we don't have it, the game that we, we that we've been conditioned to perform for, whenever we don't have it, a lot of us have a hard time con- transitioning into the real world, which is something that I kind of want to point out just because um, people struggle with that. A lot of athletes struggle with that, having their own identity and understanding what they, what they can and can't do out here in the real world. Um, but yeah, um, I don't feel like people necessarily respect the position because people, like for example, whenever I told people I was playing in Canada, they were just like, "Oh, well, why don't you try to play in America?" <laughs> and I, and I was just thinking, like, you if know, it, like if it was, <laughs> yeah, right. If it was that easy, then I would do it, you know. Yeah. But that's just like I'm asking. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to play for the Dolphins or any of the other 30, thirty-two NFL teams, but it's just not cut, cut. I mean, cut out that way right now, you know. Yeah. So how do you deal with it when, like, say, you know, being a free agent or whatnot and you're waiting for, you know, the next phone call or whatnot, how do you deal with it so it doesn't affect the way you interact with, you know, your loved ones or the ones closest to you? Well, me personally, I just I I, I just had to understand personally that my family's going to love me no matter what. Um, there is a period of time where whenever whenever I got released the last time I was like I don't I don't know man you know I I don't know just because um, off of the football thing you know you, you put in so much to produce you have so much invested into it to, just to be able to produce or just to be good at it you invest so much of it like your time and your body and um you sacrifice so a lot of sacrifices definitely a lot of sacrifice a lot of sacrifice so um, I struggled with that for a bit, but me personally, you know, I mean, I watch the game. I watch the game on TV, and it's like I, I don't watch it. I don't feel like I watch it from a fan standpoint. I feel like I understand the game. So whenever I watch it, I watch it from a different point of view, just just being a player. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And and I don't watch it necessarily. I don't really enjoy it with the naiveness of not knowing what's going on, you know? 
I'm watching the game and I'm and I'm standing up and I'm just like, yeah, man, this is coming, that's coming, you know. I'm excited as if I'm as if I'm there on the sideline playing, like playing chess, you know. It's right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, um, I felt like that's I feel like that's why I haven't necessarily given up playing football just because I I, I just care so much about it. I love football. You know, I, I'm still I'm I'm still very much emotionally invested in it, and even e- even for your call. Even though it was a even though it was a new league and a new and a new uh, development, I was there every day with a smile on my face, you know, going through it, just the grind of it. I love football. You could ask anybody at, at your call football, Julie Marringer, Colin Vuitton. I always had a smile on my face going through the process, just because I, I I was that much bought into the program that they were doing, or just football period. You know, I was that I was I was I was pretty much in love with getting better every day. And I'm actually still pretty pretty close with um my, my former O line coach there, which is uh Coach Mosley, Chris Mosley. He was actually he was actually one of the O line coaches for the Dolphins a while ago. Yeah, it's important to network. You know, you never know, you know who you know. Is who you know that really helps a lot. Definitely. Definitely. You you know. You told me how you feel about, you know, if people respect your situation or whatnot. And, you know, you told me about the toll that it, it carries or it causes. What are some things family members and friends need to realize when a person is dealing with, you know, free agency? Um, I would just say that anybody, didn't, anybody going through a transition, and I feel like people can use these use these words with any life lesson. If you're going through a transition, people need support. Whether it's whether it's being let go from a job or um, in search of a new job, everybody needs to be able to support each other. Because it's it, it's very similar to being fired from your job <laughs> in the real world and, and looking for another one. It's very similar to that. But but I would say what got me through was just the overall support in the end. So when you when you mention support, um for an athlete there's a lot of support. Like they get support well, you know, you get support from your family, your friends or whatnot, you get support from fans or whatnot, you know, you get support from the organization you're playing for. Um but then like say when you have money there's so many people who are coming at you who want to give you support, but some people come with good intentions and then a lot of people come with bad intentions. What do you think about players who give the responsibility of handling their money to other people? I don't, I don't, you know what? I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that necessarily. Um, I've never let anybody handle my money. I've always been, I've always, um, even to this day, I still have the mobile mobile banking apps on my phone. If I pay for something at the store, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving out of the store and an hour later I'm checking to make sure I, I didn't get over overpriced. Uh-huh. I'm very, I'm very meticulous with the, whenever it comes to money, just because, I mean, there is, um, like you said, Shaheem, there are people who are trying to, who are trying to capitalize off of other people's um, lack of knowledge or carelessness. Um, a lot of times athletes feel like, a lot of times athletes feel like, well, I have so much money or I know I'm going to get paid this week or a certain amount of dollars. So they're kind of careless. But um, I'm the kind of person, even if it's 10 bucks, I still care about it whenever it's leaving my hand, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so, um, I would just say, man, as far as support goes, you have to make sure that whenever you deal with people, that that you just feel them out first. Because a lot of times whenever you're an athlete, I don't know an athlete who doesn't have a lot of friends. You know, just because people always want to rub shoulders with the guy who's doing something popular, you know, or doing something amazing. And that's it, and that's just the uh the society we live in. 
people always want to be associated with somebody who's cool or doing something popular or something that's kind of um not 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 normal or regular so then they could feel like they're just as important of course, definitely. Or somebody could. I mean, I can't tell you how many times people say, "Oh, well, I, I know Big Vince," or even if I'm at a, you know, in college at a party or something, and somebody, that's Big Vince. I'm, I mean, you know, it's just a lot of, a lot of shoulder rubber for nothing, you know. I got you. And it's hard to see who's genuine and who's not. Definitely, it's definitely that. So I'm gonna um, say a couple of names, and uh, these names that I'm gonna say, they're you know individuals, you know public figures who had financial advisors, and you know they were treated poorly, like their advisor took advantage of them. Um, and I just want you know for you to share your thoughts on these people. So the first one is Tim Duncan. The second one is Clinton Portis. And then the third one is Rihanna. These are all individuals who had, you know, financial advi advisors and um, their advisors, you know, uh, cheated them out of their money um, and, you know, took millions of dollars or caused them to lose millions of dollars. And I believe in Tim Duncan's case, I'm not, I think this is true, but I'm not sure. Don't quote me on this, but I think his advisor was having an affair with his wife. But I could be wrong. Wow, man. Uh, man, for Tim Duncan, I mean, of course, I don't know him personally, but I, I would hate that for Tim Duncan just because I mean he was such a he was such a class act for the Spurs organization. Man, he was not a dirty player, textbook player, uh, very fundamentally sound. Um, I hate that for him. As far as Clinton Porters goes, I'm, I can remember cleaning up, cleaning up my room first thing in the morning on Saturday, so I could sit in front of my TV and and and, uh, and watch the Hurricanes. Mm, yeah, I agree. I remember that. Uh, he was one of my personal favorites. Um, I hate that happened to him. I actually played football with his cousin, um, Andre Cates. Um, I played football with his cousin in college. Um, and Rihanna. It sucks to have that happen to Rihanna. I mean, she's gorgeous. I don't know her personally or whatever, but for sure she generated a lot of money. She's one of the top uh, female artists. And even though they make a lot of money and whatnot, you know, they the money that they lost, they worked for it. So definitely, if they find out that someone has betrayed them and caused them to lose money that you know they put in hours, they put hours in for, or like you know they put in you know, sweat or tears or blood, you know, that can cause you to do certain things. I remember reading um, an article um, where I guess the journalist had interviewed Clinton Portis and Clinton Portis, once he found out that, you know, his, you know, advisor, or, or I believe it was like a business partner who he had was, you know, stealing from him. He was thinking about, you know, committing a crime and, you know, someone had to talk him out of doing it. And then you know Rihanna, she created a song, uh, um, based yeah. about it. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know the song I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, I do, I do, I do. Yeah. So you know, playing with people's money can cause you to do, can cause a person to you know react to, in ways that you know. That's not the normal personality. Right. Yeah. But what do you think about hiring a financial advisor who was a former professional athlete? Do you think that that type of advisor would have the player's interest, or do you think you would still have to be cautious as well? I think you would. I think I think you would still have to be cautious, period, because, I mean, no matter the job profession, you still have to judge someone, judge someone off of their character. I mean, you never, especially whenever money gets involved, man, money's very tricky. I mean, family turn their back on you for the right price. You know, some families. I mean, but you gotta, you gotta make sure you're careful. No matter what. Yeah, that's very true. Um, 
Kanye West, you know, in a Real Friends, you know, he was talking about his cousin. He had to pay him two hundred thousand dollars to get a laptop. So, mm -hmm. because it had some some uh, private things on it that he that he that he had on it, and he didn't want you know the public to see it. And that's your own family. So, even if an athlete is a financial advisor, and you think, oh, you know, we uh kind of had the same background, so he'll have the best interest for me that's not always you know the case correct yeah i came across an article um on cn cnbc and um in the article it states 60 percent of nba players go broke within five years of departing from the league and 78 percent of former nfl players experience financial distress two years after retirement what are your thoughts on this? My thoughts are I I could see it happening. Um, a lot of the times, like I'll tell you something, Shaheem. Whenever it's payday in those locker rooms, man, everybody's everybody's man. What you doing, man? What you doing? Where we going? What you you know? People come in, people come in the locker room, and they got new stuff on. They talk about the new car they just bought, whatever, whatever. And man, like nobody. Nobody really says, like, you know, like, save this or save that. A lot of times, um, your checks are going to be fat, and they're going to come fast. So it's like whenever you get it, you feel like it's, you feel like it's never going to stop. You know what I mean? And it's like, and, and that's not reality. So <laughs> um, you kind of shouldn't think that way. But at the same time, though, a lot of times uh, these athletes come from uh, poverty-stricken areas. So... Whenever that happens and uh, you go back to your old neighborhood or your old hometown or whatever like that, and people know you have money, these are people that you grew up with. So, you know, so you can't tell, so you can't tell people no, or you feel like, or you feel like you're obligated to them to be able to provide for them because you're, because you're the one who's financially dominant in their eyes. But it's just, it's just really unfortunate because it happens all the time, but I'm not surprised. Yeah, I, I feel like players, when they see other players, you know, getting the newest, you know, shoes or jacket or watch, or like you said, cars or whatnot, it's that competitive nature. They're like, oh, man, they got all this stuff. Man, I could get this stuff, too. And, yeah, it's fine and dandy, but like you said, it doesn't last forever. And Correct. That's the downfall for a lot of players. I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying... That you can't, you know, indulge once in a while, but you know you gotta be responsible when you do that. You gotta invest for like a rainy day. Definitely. In the same article that I just mentioned, there was also a quote that stated that one year of big pay often has to last for sixty years. Establishing sustainable long-term spending practices and settling into a manageable lifestyle is of the utmost importance. How do you discipline yourself to remember this when the money is coming in and life seems great? Um, I would just say you have to you have to make sure you think about the end result. Try to set yourself up so the I would say try to set yourself up so that you don't have to so that you don't have to uh necessarily worry about money. You know, financially as far as maybe possibly opening a business. Or just finding something that you like that can generate you money without you having to, you know, go through go through long hours of working for it. I agree. I have a I have a um a couple of college teammates who are doing that exact thing. You know, well, one he was actually playing in the CFL. His name is uh Brandon Bryant. And uh you know, he actually started a franchise with, you know, another of one of our college teammates and you know and so like you know he has money coming in from you know playing football well both of them do and then you know they also have money coming in from their business so it's always good to have more than one revenue or stream of revenue coming in because if one dries up then the other one is still going and then it allows you to have time to try to create another revenue definitely so you know, I hope, you know, everything goes well in your favor. You know, I hope that, you know, you're able to 
you know, sign with another team after, you know, the year called football season, um, you know, completes. But like, let's say, well, we all know that there is a possibility that, let's say, that might not happen or you might not sign with, you know, another professional contract. How do you prepare for that? I, I would, I mean, being that, being that I'm used to, I'm kind of used to the transition phase by now. Um, I've came to the conclusion a long time ago, especially with adjusting and being in the real world for a while. Um, I understand that football is something that I do, but football doesn't define me as a person. With that, be- with that being said, I mean, at, at, at the school that I work at, the principal wants me to go full time and be a permanent teacher there just because I've, I've had such a positive influence on the, on, on the students. And also I'm, I've been a pleasure to work with. I've been very accommodating to the staff and the administration. So she thinks that I will be a very positive figure for the kids because where I work is an inner city school. So a lot of the kids don't have uh, father figures or any male figures at home. Um, However, just knowing that I will have that kind of opportunity just lets me know that I can be able to um, function in the real world and be able to and be able to still make an impact. And I feel like every athlete should think about that. What other impact can you make besides on a football field? Because no matter how good you are, the game will still be here after your career is done. So try to figure out what what else it is that you truly like. And just keep it in the back of your mind. And whenever it's the offseason or whatever, just um, look into it. Try to work on it. Try to Try to see what it is that you would like. Okay, so I got two questions for you. So, you know, after, like say if you were to pursue that full-time teaching position, what uh, what subject would it be? Definitely PE. <laughs> Definitely coaching. Definitely coaching. Um, just, see, just seeing kids enjoy themselves, that puts a smile on my face. Kids enjoy themselves. Um... I like that, but also I, I'm very big on reading. I like to read personally in my own spare time, my own free time. Um, so it'd probably be either one of those two, but definitely PE or that or uh, reading. That's good. I respect that. I am in the same boat as you. I am either gonna do PE or like English. Yeah, correct. Me too, man. Me too. And especially as a black person, well, I've been told this a lot since, uh, you know, I've been teaching or whatnot. Uh, they say there's not as many black men in that field. And they they say it's a great thing when they see one in there. So, you know, just I'll just say, you know, kudos to you for what you're doing. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely true. So this is a perfect segue for my next question. You know, growing up, you know, you've you've watched the 30 for 30, right? Yes, sir. Yes, man, 30 for 30. And you know, the the famous one about, you know, athletes going broke. Yep. So growing up, you always heard about well-known athletes going broke after their career. But now, I think like in these last couple of years, I think we hear more stories about athletes who are preparing for life after they're playing by networking with businesses and turning their niche into a job. Why do you think it is important for players to do this while they are active players? I think it's important for you to, I think it's important for you to network while you're active because I think that goes back to what, to what we talked about earlier. Just saying everybody wants to be associated with, with, somebody who's doing something currently right now. Um I feel like I feel like you you hold you hold a higher value. Yeah. Whenever whenever you're actively playing just because I mean you are who you are in that very moment. Your name carries a lot of weight. Definitely. It definitely does. And I, I don't I, unless you're like Odell Beckham or Antonio Brown or somebody like that, I don't think your name would hold the same weight after you played. You know, so it's definitely good. How do you think entrepreneurship has changed over the last 10 years for, you know, athletes? 
I think people are realizing that um, eventually having your own business is the way to go. I think people are understanding that even even with the music that we listen to or whatever. I mean, like with the with the uh, Rick Ross and Nipsey Hussle, the urban the urban rappers are are really pushing for all people money to have their own business. Yeah, all money in. That's right. Uh, even Meek Mill on his last album, everybody's everybody is encouraging entrepreneurship and ownership and things like that. So um, I think that's really good for us being black men and just listening to urban music with that. Um, I feel like, I feel like it's given, it's given athletes something to think about because, because you are what you read, eat and listen to. So with all of us hearing that constantly, then I feel like, I feel like that's kind of influential. Definitely. It definitely is. I agree a hundred percent. And I'll add one other thing and also who you surround yourself with as well, because you keep on surrounding yourself with negative people who aren't doing anything, then you're going to, you know, end up doing the same thing. But if you surround yourself with, you know, billionaires or millionaires, then, you know, you're going to, you know, their ideas, you know, just like their will and their drive is going to rub off on you. And then it's going to make you want to become a billionaire, a millionaire. You see Meek Mill, he was talking about he wants to be a billionaire. Definitely. And you know, uh, Nipsey Hustle. Um, I'm glad you mentioned him. You know, his last album, Victory Lap. That's all he was talking about. You know, how to generate money. Rick Ross as well. Looking forward to the Port of Miami too. Definitely, I definitely am too. That's one of my favorite artists. Yeah. Okay. And also, there's a there's a. I'm not gonna say he's underground because I'm I've met people from Georgia, New York. Philly, and they know this man, but he's from here. Do you know who I'm talking about? What's his name? Iceberg. Yeah, of course, of yeah. course. So he's he's also another example of you know a black businessman, and he's he started from the ground, and you know he's built you know kind of a you know I guess you could call it legacy for himself. You know he's has his own company, his own music label, things of that nature, and I feel like these are all things athletes can look at and try to imitate. And it's nothing wrong with imitating it because they're all positive things. Definitely. Um, but you know how you mentioned, you know, uh, individuals wanting to be millionaires or whatnot. What do you think about what the Golden State Warriors are doing when it comes to investing in startups? I think that's good just because, I mean, you have to think about it, man. Everybody everybody started somewhere. But it's like at the same time, once those once those uh, companies start up and they, and they take off, the sky's the limit, man. The sky's the limit. Like, for example, like the video game Fortnite, Fortnite started off as a free game. I mean, as a matter of fact, it still is a free game. But then it, it it blew up into 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 uh into something where even Drake's talking about it. You know, all the celebrities are talking about it, stuff like that. So yeah, um, especially all the kids at school. Exactly. I'm, I I can't tell you how many times I have to tell kids at my school to stop doing the Fortnite dance in class. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, it, it's a wave. It's funny though. It is. It is. But it, it's a big wave. So um, while we're talking about investments or whatnot, um, do you plan on making any investments or do you have any investments, if you don't mind sharing? Um, I'm looking into some things right now, just something small, but not, not anything big. Um, I personally, I like, I like, uh, I like, I like uh, snacks. Snacks? I like snacks, so I want to invest in possibly acquiring a vending machine. Or a couple of vending machines. Yeah, you can't go wrong with that. People are always trying to get food. And yeah, I think that's a commodity. Yeah, or possibly even getting something as simple as a, as a bubble gum machine. A you know, something simple. A, a bubble gum machine. Something simple to put in a nail salon or something like that. Okay. Can you go further into depth on why a bubble gum machine? I'm, I'm interested. 
Just so, just something simple, whether it's candy or or, or chips or bubble gum, just something simple. Um, they're convenient. You can place them anywhere. You can place them in, a, in any regular store. Um, and you just have to pay to pay to, to to your to your surroundings whenever you're somewhere. Um, I can't tell you how many times I'm in the barber shop and kids and and after a kid gets a haircut, before they leave, they're begging their mom or dad for a quarter to get it to, to get something out of the bubble gum machine. Okay. <laughs> no, I feel on that. I feel yeah, it. Yeah, and and every time you look, you just I mean, I, I just wondered. I was just like, I mean, I wonder how much one of those things makes. Yeah, because imagine how many how many people come into that barber shop and then imagine how many kids want bubble gum, so it adds up. Definitely. So, you know, we've spoken about how to prepare for free agency, what to do during free agency. We've spoken about, you know, how it can be stressful or how to react during that process. We've spoken about how to network. We've spoken about investments. But now, how do you deal with relationships? Like when you're a free agent or when you're in free agency, you know, and when I say relationships, I mean like relationships for like a significant other. Um, well, you know what, honestly, I would, I would just have to say, and I feel like every athlete knows this by now, but, um, if you're going to make someone your, your significant other and you're an athlete, then she has to understand, you know, like what it takes because. I mean, like, if that's your significant other, most likely they know what you went through or what you're going through. Um, but hopefully she's just, hopefully she she has her head on straight just like you, or she's that person in your ear to just say, hey, well, you know, we don't need to buy this, we don't need to buy that. You know, or or she could, she could hopefully help you make smart investments with your money and your time. And y'all could work together to be able to move forward and accomplish something together. But it definitely takes, but it definitely takes a special person to be able to date an athlete. Yeah, they gotta be able to trust you and have a lot of patience. Definitely, they definitely do. Okay, but say before you even, I say you meet someone and you're thinking about making this person your significant other, but you're not sure. How do you like? You know, you know people like athletes. I know athletes would wish, like, man, I wish I could find a girl. And, you know, not have to worry about, oh, does she like me for me or does she like me because of who I am? What would you recommend? I would just recommend just completely being honest. Like, you know, like just completely being yourself and and don't get don't get necessarily all the way sidetracked by trying to by trying to entice uh, somebody like that. Um don't um don't waste too much time trying to impress that person just be yourself and stay focused and if it's meant to be then 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 they'll be around you know like don't don't skip a workout to go on a date you know like work out first or if you or if you have to go on a date first go on a date first and then work out after but make but make sure that they understand like the reality of it sooner rather than later you know because the sooner the better the sooner the better because they can understand what they're getting themselves into. Yeah. Instead of instead of later, and they're saying, you know, you're changing and stuff like that. And how do you think an athlete avoids a situation like a a shady McCoy situation? Man, I would just say you just gotta certain things like that. You just gotta walk away, man. Yeah. You gotta swallow. You gotta swallow that pride. Money brings you pride a lot of the times because you have so much of it. In a, in a, in a sense, you have a lot of money and, and you have a bit of status or whatever like that. So people think that they that they can't be touched or that they feel, they feel entitled. Do you think breakups are a common thing when a player is facing free agency? Of course. I mean, just because I mean, transition isn't necessarily easy, but you have to make sure that you have the right partner by you. I mean, things get rough when, whenever the money stops coming in, the way it was coming in. Relationships with your, with your significant other, 
you'll even lose friends too. And then also, you know, like say if, you know, you guys are in like one specific state or whatnot, and then you, you know, you, you sign a deal with, let's say the 49ers and say you're living in Florida and then you're like, oh, I'm going to, you know, California, but then, you know, your significant other has, you know, a job and everything situated in, you know, Florida, you know, that can, I feel like that could be a reason that, you know, a breakup happens just because of long distance. And then, you know, like how you mentioned, um, you know, a significant other has to be able to trust, have a lot of trust and have a lot of patience and, you know, not everyone has that. Right. That's definitely true. That's definitely true. So like, how do free, like say when a person's a free agent and you know, like when you're playing for a team or whatnot and you're in that, you know, city or state or whatnot, how do, you know, players deal with like, leasing a home or like ha finding a place to stay? How does that work? I know some players, you know, stay with another player, but I know that's not always the case. Yeah, it's not always the case, but in my case, that, that's 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 what I did. Like for when I was in Canada, the team has like, the team has like certain people that um, like certain places that they recommend where you live, like in the area or whatever like that, and they'll have it, and they and they have certain realtors and stuff that that uh, deal with that deal with the players. So it's good. Okay, so I think. I've asked you enough questions. It's it's been over an hour, so I know I don't want to, you know, take up any more of your time because you know you might be. I think you're a busy man, and uh, <laughs> you know I'm gonna say this concludes you know the interview. Thank you, Vincent, for time and jumping on to the Sports Lit podcast. I really appreciate all the insight that you shared with me and for all the people who are gonna listen. Definitely, Shaheem. Thank you for having me. And I'm, and I'm glad to be able to give insight on, on, on life as an athlete. If you made it to the end of this interview, thank you. Feel free to reach out to me via social media and let me know what was your favorite part of this interview with Vincent. You can reach me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or YouTube. All you have to do is just type in my name, Shaheem Sutherland.